Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another New Jersey Constitutional Republican virtual conversation. Today, we have Dr. Kenneth Janda, who is the Peyton S. Wild Professor Emeritus of Political Science at Northwestern University, is the author or co-author of numerous books, including the textbook, The Challenge of Democracy, American Government and Global Politics. And he was the co-editor of the journal Party Politics for two decades. Dr. Janda received the Samuel J. Eldersveld Lifetime Achievement Award for his work on political parties and the Frank J. Goodnow Award for service to the discipline, both from the American Political Science Association. Dr. Janda has published extensively in comparative party politics, research methodology, and early use of computer technology in political science, for which he received awards from Udocom and support from Apple Computer. Major examples are data processing, applications to political research, political parties, a cross-national survey, and the challenge of democracy, American government, and global politics. His APSA awards include the Samuel Edersveld Lifetime Achievement Award and the Frank J. Goodnow Award for Distinguished Service to the Profession. Today, joined us to discuss his latest book, The Republican Evolution, From Governing Party to Anti-Government Party, 1860. 2020. Dr. Janda, it's an honor to have you here with us today. Well, it's my it's an honor for me to be here and it's great my great pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me. Here is the book and we're going to be discussing uh we're doing a thorough analysis of this very very important book um that I discovered a few months ago and have been reading thoroughly and I also just want to share with our audience uh, a share screen that we will also be providing in the link to this video, The Republican Evolution here is the flyer. And uh, graciously enough, we will be afforded a 20% discount on this fine book um, from the entering the code that we will provide and the flyer. All of the information is on the flyer that we will also be pro providing for a link to in the video. And uh, the book is entitled The Republican Evolution. It's a very provocative cover. Of course, we see... Uh, the profile of one Abraham Lincoln, who also uh, we highly revere, see with the, our New Jersey Constitution Republicans logo, and then of the last Republican president uh, on there as well. But uh, Dr. Jand, I just want to start with reading a couple of your words from the book so that we know what your purpose was for writing this very important book. The, quote, the book aims not to trash the party, but to help restore the GOP to its former grandeur by documenting the party's original principles and how they have changed over time. I hope to remind Republicans of their party's history of promoting national unity while governing for the public good. And also in the introduction, Dr. Janda writes, I wrote this book for contemporary Republican activists who are uneasy with the trajectory of their party, hoping some among them will act to restore the GOP's old grandeur, unquote. Dr. Janda, I have to th say that I believe you are referencing uh, our organization as those activists. I, I would be delighted if if anything that I wrote would have work in, in, in any way in that direction. That would please me no end. Okay, now, uh, Dr. Janda, the first question is, why is it important that our nation have a responsible and competitive two-party system? First, you know, first of all, I've been doing this for a long, long time. Uh, I'm an old guy, and much of my career has been spent in doing uh, cross-national analysis of political parties. And it's generally regarded, and my own research has established, that countries with competitive party systems have uh, ha, generally have better governments. And they do that basically because of the competition between healthy political parties. A political party is a form of collective action. Citizens get together to back the policies that they that they prefer. And the argument is that they then try to convince other voters that their policies are right. In this interplay between ideas, they, they conduct elections and they win elections. And presumably the ones who have the best policies win the more elections. Now, the curious thing, I think, is with respect to the two-party system, because the United States is really pretty unique in having a two-party system. As a matter of fact, if you look at 
democracies across the world, they all have competitive party systems. Most of them have more than two parties. As a matter, as a matter of fact, there is no country that has only a two-party system for any length of time. Occasionally, there'd be two parties governing for a short period of time, but not for extensive times. Why? Well, basically, it's due to the structure of our, con our of our government, our constitution, and the rules for electing people. We use a system that's first past, they call it first past to post. The, per the person who gets the most votes wins. In a game theoretic context, contest, that means then there's not much ro role for third parties. And so you really need to have the contest between the two major parties. And third parties have never really had a much of a role in our society. And and so therefore, to have a healthy party system, you have to have a healthy two-party system. And uh, and I and I just think that part of that is to be very responsible in making your your, your case to the, to the people and then delivering on that and being faithful. Right now, in the book, a Doctor, you identify three distinctive eras for the Republican Party. So just uh, describe for us briefly, if you could, the first era, which would be the national era of the party from 1860 to 1924. <clears throat> that was um, the first era and, and in effect, one of the longest eras uh, of the party. During that era, the Republican Party was A, a national party, and B, it governed it for the public good at least in the Republicans' eyes of, in a public good, and in many other people's regard. Look at it, it gave us the, the Morrill Act, the land-grant colleges. It built the uh, Transcontinental Railroad. It built the Panama Canal. It just did so many things that were very good for the development of the nation. And I should point out that it also raised revenue to do that. That was part of the government. It didn't avoid making money because it knew it had to spend money to provide the public good. And our country prospered as a result of the Republican Party uh, from 1860 to 1924. Excellent. Now, and then in 19, then the party entered what I would call, and other people call, kind of a neoliberalism era. Um, it may have been that success was a little bit too good a thing. So people were making money, but they were saying, you know, maybe we could make a little bit more money if there was less government regulation. So the party became sort of seized by um, glorifying free enterprise and the absence of government control. The same party that pioneered trust busting suddenly then went into against reg regulation. And, you know, one of the things that came out of that was the depression, you know, and, uh, uh, and then so that lasted and the Republican Party still tried to keep up with that throughout the the um, the, I, the Roosevelt era, but the people weren't buying it, and they were getting a lot of good goodies from the from Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So that lasted then to about nineteen in the late fifties. Then in nineteen sixty four, the the party entered what I called the ethnocentrism era. And suddenly, there, it was a combination of two things. First, there was, there was a continuation of the freedom argument, but it was no longer just freedom from government, from economic regulation. It was freedom from social regulation. Now, problem, freedom is a difficult kind of concept. You know, the, the Democrats in 1828 were arguing for freedom too. But what they meant there is freedom to discriminate. Now, they wanted to be able to, to hire black, uh, not hire, just enslave black. And that was their concept of freedom at that time. The blacks, of course, didn't think about that way, but that's what the, the whites did at that time. They wanted that freedom. And so with the Goldwater candidacy in, in, in 1964, and Goldwater, by the, by the way, was not himself for racist. He was a card-carrying member, a National Life member of the NAACP, and uh, uh, he certainly wasn't re a religious bigot. He was, uh, you know, of a Jewish heritage. He was raised as an Episcopalian, but he was a Jewish heritage. Mm -hmm. So, but Goldwater saw quite correctly there's an opportunity to get votes from the South. And unfortunately, I think the party then went too much in that direction. And so then it was went off in a different direction. Suddenly it was in a position in which government is bad. And uh, that was not good for uh, the Republican Party. Right. And uh, why we talk, so that was what we call the ethnocentric uh, era, which 1964, right up until the present day that the Republican Party is in. But uh, I think it would be beneficial, doctor, for the office if we could talk about the evolution of the application given to the 
terminologies of liberal and conservative over time as they relate to the Republican Party? How is that? How have those two words changed? Yeah, you know, um, right now we talk about everything in terms of left, right, liberal, conservatives. Mm -hmm. This is really a post-1950 phenomenon. If you go back in the party platform, the Republican Party platform, you will find that the Republicans often referred with pride to their liberal policies. So that was, it, liberal was in that way generous. They were being fair and generous and open. Um, around the 1980s, liberal became a dirty word. Mm -hmm. And suddenly it, it no longer saw any kind of benefit in that. And uh, so what's happened is that we've gotten a, a coloration of the terms and both sides, not just the Democrat, not the Republicans, but the Democrats, have used those terms in a way that isn't beneficial to public discourse, if you will. Um, and I think what's happened now with, re with respect to the Republican Party is that the conservatives really, sometimes people say the Freedom Caucus is a really strong conservative. No, I would say they're not strong conservatives. They're libertarian. Mm -hmm. They're different from conservatives. Historically, conservatives have always favored government. They wanted government because the mobs would take things away from them. Mm -hmm. You know, it was always the government was, was their friend mm -hmm. and they backed government. And now suddenly they're in a strange place in which the government is the enemy. I, as a political scientist, and look back over history, think, how in the world do we ever come to this situation? No, it's not an enemy. And as long as it's always going to be an enemy, the Republican Party is always going to have a problem. What uh, is remarkable about the book uh, doctor, is your research of 2,722 Republican Party planks from 1856 right up until 2016, which was the last Republican Party platform, doing a thorough analysis and breaking down the different topics and the different charts, which are very, very helpful that you'll be able to see and read in the book, and then going over certain topics uh, that were identified by the Republican Party. And, and speaking of the liberal conservative um, dichotomy there, if you will, you mentioned that the Republican Party used the word liberal in their platform quite a bit, right up until what you say, until the 19th. Oh, oh yeah, that's right. It, it didn't become a dirty word really until the Reagan uh, administration. And, and this is something that Ronald Reagan uh, adapted and it paid off for him politically. But I think it left a, an unwanted legacy for the party because suddenly it it sort of meant that if you did anything with the government, you were somehow or other uh, being uh, against the Reagan policies. You're, you're, you're not being a true conservative. And I, I just think that certainly that's certain not, if Lincoln were here, he'd, he'd say, oh my gosh, that's not, that's not what we intended initially. And, uh, and obviously I think that's true. I think too, doctor, that we could make, uh, consider the fact that uh, the use of the word liberal was taken over by FDR as he began the uh, New Deal era and basically reclaiming that word uh, for the Democratic Party. And of course, Hoover and Hayes yeah, had, a great, great, had a great debate with him over the what we call the two phases of liberalism, which was a book written by our great late friend, Dr. Gordon Lloyd. Yeah, th th that's a good point. It's actually one that I have, have, have not, I should deal with more, but I think you're quite right. There was a, a, a tussle over the, the symbolism of the word at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I, I think that uh, FDR was able to wrestle it away uh, for their use with, with the party. And, uh, and of course, even some very distinguished Republican lawmakers, even to their last day, Taft, for, not, not Taft, but uh, yeah, Taft was considered himself a liberal, even at the, uh, at the end of his life, he still right. regarded himself right. as a liberal. Now, doctor, you make uh, some very good distinctions for us to be able to understand the evolution of the Republican Party. Talk about uh, the difference between party, team, tribe, and cult. So what constitutes a party? Okay, Edmund Burke yep. defined, uh, uh, you know, in the seven, 18th century, Defined a political party as a, a body of people united to pursue a particular interest. And that uniting people in, in a body means collective action. Okay. And so they take collective action in order to pursue some kind of ideal, some vision of a public good. An electoral team is a political organization that is takes collective action in order to win an election. 
Now, obviously, electoral teams have short-term focus in mind. Mm -hmm. Political parties have long-term focus in mind. Mm -hmm. And so electoral teams tend to be tactical, not strategic. And they tend to do what they think is going to be good for them to win that particular election. But usually there's a blending of the party and the team at election. And usually the blending is pretty smooth. Sometimes it's not. I think coming up to this particular election, you will see that it is not going to be very smooth. The uh, tribe, yeah, the tribe is um, a group of people who are who see themselves as a collective ent- uh, I- through identity with some particular organization. I think fan base is a great op- uh, example. Uh, I live in Minnesota. Uh, Viking fans are very, very strong. <laughs> And uh, Viking fans versus Packer fans, my heavens, you'd almost have a battle on the streets on that. Mm -hmm. So this is their own identity. It's not just that they're they're the team. It's their identity. Mm -hmm. So nowadays, Republicans see themselves as being identified with, with the brand. And Democrats do, too. No, it's not just just Republican. So what was happening, we get a kind of a tribal politics in which the stakes are higher because it's personal. Okay, and then the the cult is a is a collectivity too, but it's a collective personal collectivity, mm-hmm. based upon loyalty to a leader, a charismatic leader, who is deemed by the followers to have the authority to direct them, and so they do whatever the leader said. And we can see that in the most extreme case, I think. Uh, uh, in uh, in Jane Jones' case, when people drank, th- oh, nearly a thousand people drank Kool Aid and killed themselves. Terrible. You know, I, it, we you can't even wrap your head around that. How would they do that sort of thing? Right. But it is a kind of involvement, an attachment, a belief that you can't really explain. But anyway. That, I think, is one of the things that's happened in the Republican Party is that there are a lot of people who attach to Trump more than to the party. Uh, the, that number has been changing over time, but there are still many people who say, yeah, I, I follow Trump more than I do the Republican Party. I just think that's dangerous. Anytime that you follow uh, a demagogue uh, is really dangerous for the political system. I have more faith in institutions and individual leaders. And uh, Dr. Janda, that is where we are con- to- completely aligned. One of the reasons why we created this organization, the New Jersey Constitutional Republicans, was to restore principles and to look towards institutions and principles, not towards personalities. We've clearly seen how the mm-hmm. Republican Party in many ways has divulged into a cult of personality. And I think that that uh, statement that you just made and that you identify in the book, people will have more loyalty, if you will, towards Trump than they do to the Republican Party and its principles. And this, of course, reminds mm-hmm. me, Dr. Janda, of the human nature and the propensity for people to want a king, to want somebody who's going to provide security for them. And in doing so, those people give up their liberties and the freedom of thought. And therefore, the uh, this the propensity has existed throughout humanity of some wanting a strong man to take care of us. Of course, Max Verber talked about the <clears throat> call to personality and uh, the charismatic leader. But the real leaders are ones who've lived by example. And of course, Abraham Lincoln personified that example. And uh, one of the reasons why we yeah, created the world. I agree. But I also wanted you to touch on, Doctor, the fact there seems to be a disconnect sometimes between what we can consider Republican leaders or local party bosses with the layman Republicans that are working as committee men and committee people throughout the uh, local organizations. And you make that interesting uh, differentiation in the book between the party bosses mm-hmm. and the ones who are doing the back uh, backroom deals and those who are doing the um, the actual work, the Republican layman, the Republican faithful. We believe it's important for the, the party to become more dr- democratic within itself. Yeah, I, I, I very definitely do. And I and actually I think that the Republican Party, um, after the loss in nineteen in twenty twelve to Obama, um, for the second time, Reince Prebush um Organa had a, a review committee on that it was called the Growth and Opportunity Project, which happens, the acronym happens to be GOP. Uh, and they made the growth and opportunity was look at, let's face it, we've been losing elections. 
we've not had a we've not won a plurality of the election for a while and we just really need to change ourselves we have to recognize that the electorate is changing and we have to reach out and make it a big tent and i thought i i i've read that report cover to cover i thought it was a good example of how to adapt to changing situation and to i've said to recognize the facts you mm-hmm. can't make a, a successful organization if you don't recognize facts. And of course, what happened then is Donald Trump takes over and he goes in exactly the opposite direction. Mm-hmm. And he manages to milk out uh, a last hurrah and be able to get, uh, manage to get a, a victory, even though he didn't win the popular vote. As a matter of fact, he lost it by 3 million votes, mm-hmm. but he managed to get an, elect- an electoral victory. Um, well, and then he appoints Reince Priebus as his chief of staff. You know, I just think that's that's crazy, absolutely yeah. crazy yeah. that that should happen that way. And I think historians will look back on this future and say this is a Republican Party had an opportunity to revitalize itself at one point, and it turned its back on that opportunity. Yeah, and, Chief, and it's a, that's a shame. You make a, you make that great point in the book, uh, Doctor. The, the the 2012, the information that was gathered, and then you're absolutely right. We took an absolute. Uh, we were looking to be more inclusive and help to communicate the Republican Party principles better. But they were overtaken by populism, angst and grievance. And um, that's what turned out to be 2016, in my estimation, hijacking our Republican Party. And um, what do you think what what do you think the significance of, of Trump looking to an Andrew Jackson, who I think he was told more about Andrew Jackson than he actually knew about Andrew Jackson, but Mm -hmm. looking to Andrew Jackson as a mentor rather than Abraham Lincoln, how significant do you think that is? I would say it's like modeling yourself after the devil rather than Jesus. (laughs) You know, I, that, that, I, you know, Andrew Jackson, um, he was an important figure in American politics in that the Democrats at that time, um, challenged the established order at that point. And um, so the popular people were able to elect someone. And that's good. That's what democracy is. And he won really quite handily and continued to win. Um, but, uh, <clears throat> but that was on a time when the economy was different and um, the, the evils of, of slavery were not appreciated across the, the nation. Mm-hmm. And people change. Ideas change. And we see that suddenly um, the thought of having the nation, new states being admitted being slavery, uh, slave states rather than free states, that was unacceptable to the Republicans. And that's why they form a, a formed a new party. Uh, but so I, I think Andrew Jackson, the only thing that, they, that, that uh, would recommend him is the fact that, yeah, he did mobilize a lot of people to vote. And Doctor, you make an excellent point in the book uh, discussing the elections of 1960, 1968, 2000 and 2016 which were much closer. These are the results of these elections were much closer than presidential elections where the loser who lost by a very, very minimal amount, I believe it was 2% in 1960. It might've been 7% in 1968 where Humphrey loses to Nixon. Nixon losing to Kennedy only by 2% of the vote. And then, of course, we had the disputed election of 2000 and then 2016. Um, Trump lost, um, like you said, by three million votes, but won the electoral. But the losers were gracious and uh, admitting defeat. Yet in 2020, the results were not even remotely close as these other elections. And for the first time in our nation's history, doctor, we did not have a peaceful and amicable transfer of power. In my estimation, that is truly remarkable, something that can, is very, very alarming and sh- and sheds bad light on our Republican Party. I don't know how to put this in the words. It, it was it was absolutely disgraceful. One of the one of the one positive thing from this is all, immediately after uh, the January sixth, immediately after the January sixth thing, virtually all Republican leaders mm-hmm. came out against the attack. Uh, unfortunately, some changed their positions after that. Uh, but 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 it was very clear that they had nothing to do with this. It was all Trump inspired. And they criticized it roundly. It's just a terrible shame that 
they didn't take him on at that time, and they should have done that. You know, I have a I have a little personal. This you may not want to uh, include this in the discussion, but I have a, a personal experience having to deal with the 2000 election. An election eve, I would have been November 6th. The election was held on November 7th in 2000. I was on a television program in Chicago on WTTW called Ch Chicago Tonight. There were four of us discussing the election, forthcoming election. Seated to my left was a young state senator from Illinois by the name of Barack Obama. To my right was a woman who was a political commentator on WBEZ, to the National Public Radio. And then to her right was a, a, a conservative columnist for the Chicago Tribune, Steve Chapman. And uh, so we talked about the election. And the host was wanted to get us into a debate. He said, you know, it looks as if it might be that when the election is over, that uh, Al Gore will win the popular electoral vote, but he'll lose the popular vote. What will the people do? What will be the result? He seemed to think that there'd be that, that there would be a kind of an uprising of that. And all of us, Steve Chapman on the right, Barack Obama, if you want to say on the left, me sort of in the middle with the other person. We all said, no, we think this country is strong. We think the Constitution is strong. We think that even if that were to happen, there will not be rioting in the street. And one of the things about that 2000 election when it was so close is that there were no windows smashed. Mm -hmm. There are no cars set on fire. And it turns out that, uh, that the decision, it took a long time, no question about that. And the Supreme Court was involved in a very peculiar way but nevertheless, at the end of that, uh, Al Gore conceded, done perfectly fine. And it turns out also that it was exactly the other way around from the way the host thought it. It right. turned out that, that Bush got the electoral vote and Al Gore won the popular vote, you know. But in any event, I am, I am by the way, not in favor of a majority vote for the to decide the president of the United States. I am in favor of the federal system we have now, uh, the electoral vote. And my reason for this is now we've had at least three, in our, my lifetime, three close elections that would have demanded nationwide recounts. Mm -hmm. Good Lord, we've seen what happens, what a recount in just one state in a few counties looks like. True. We can't tolerate that. We would have so much skullduggery going on all across the nation. You could never monitor, monitor it. It would be awful. So my liberal, many of my liberal colleagues want to have popular vote election. I think that's crazy. Anytime you have a elector that has 100 million people or more in there, you cannot rely on a popular vote because in close elections, the true winner is always in disputed ballots and there's no resolution for disputed ballots. Anyway, that's a little sermon that I that I like to deliver from time to time, and I've done it now. Well, I certainly appreciate the uh, anecdotal information in the story. It's fantastic and very fascinating, Doctor. And I agree with you, and the Constitutional Republicans agree with you, that we need to preserve our electoral college. It's another uh, aspect of the true federalism that uh, the founders mm -hmm. entitled. And incidentally, you make great distinction in the book between what federalism is thought to be and what it actually is as well, the concept of federalism. Mm -hmm. And uh, yep. as we wind down, I wanted you to talk, uh, We you mentioned this briefly, but I'd like to talk about it just a little bit more. And that is the difference between today's libertarian movement and the initial Republican Party principle. Because a lot of libertarians will think of themselves as Republicans, but what is the difference between the libertarian view and the actual initial Republican view of liberty to all, as Lincoln said? Of course, liberty, when Lincoln was talking in the when slavery was the issue of the of the day, and when he said liberty to all, he was really talking about slavery. So you have to put it in context. Mm -hmm. And so he he meant people free of bondage. That's a word that he, that that Lincoln often used in, in his speeches, right. and that's what he meant. But. As, but liberty and freedom are often used interchangeably. But as I say, the Democrats early used to talk about liberty and freedom. As a matter of fact, uh, I found in my, I'm now doing a book on the democratic evolution. And in the early platforms, that's what the Democrats are talking about. Freedom, freedom, freedom. Mm -hmm. But they meant their freedom to, to do what they wanted with their, with their economy. Mm -hmm. you know? and, uh, and they didn't want any national government 
interference with their, quote, peculiar institution mm -hmm. uh, in the South. Uh, and so uh, I, I just think that the, the today's libertarians just don't have that right. They have to take the context in it. And Lincoln was talking about slavery. Doctor, as we wind down, I wanted to uh, suggest that uh, as we look at these different evolutionary changes within the Republican Party, that we can think about the laws of causation and uh, cause and effect, of, if you will. Now, coming out of uh, the Woodrow Wilson administration and World War I and the remarkable debt and the terrible loss of American life in World War I and the uh, effects that it had worldwide. I think we see Calvin Coolidge and even William Harding before him talking about normality and restoring normality. Mm -hmm. Getting back to normalcy was really the campaign slogan of 1920. And mm -hmm. Coolidge, who was somewhat progressive in, in certain aspects, uh, started to repudiate the over the overindulgence of progressivism of Wilson's administration and, and Wilson's ideas. And then later mm -hmm. on, we we see this with uh, the New Deal and, of course, Hoover, Herbert Hoover providing the intellectual basis, replying against the idea of managed economies, uh, the expansion of federal government. So we see another cause and effect there. And then we see it again in the 60s with the um, with the LBJ and his great society and essentially uh, Ronald Reagan being the answer to that, uh, you know, too much government. Uh, getting government off our back. But Reagan believed the government should be working with us. He didn't want to eliminate government. He said, let's have it work with us as opposed to over us, is what he said in his first inaugural. So don't you think there's an interesting cause and effect that causes these evolutionary changes in the thinking of the party? Oh, well, that's, that's an interesting idea. Uh, I do think that um, um, parties clearly react to positions taken by the opposition. That always is true. And so if the opposition takes one position, you've got to think about it, you're going to take another position. Not always, you know, but usually. And, and one way, because your followers expect you to differentiate yourself from the opposition. So in a way, whoever takes the position first gets a strategic advantage, mm -hmm. maybe a little bit like in a wrestling situation, you know, mm -hmm. you get a strategic advantage by taking a position first. I guess um, my my problem now, uh, my, my, my worry about the Republican Party right now mm -hmm. is that it's almost gun shy of taking any position that would um, indicate that it really wants to do other than, than trade in cultural benefits, that it doesn't see anything that it can do that can actually provide something material for people. The, the cultural benefits to say no or to promote this, that, the other thing, but that's not that's not a way to operate. And it's never been a way. It certainly wasn't the way that the Republican Party operated uh, in its nationalism era, right. or even for that matter, um, in its neoliberalism era. Uh, and um, I, I do think that the Republicans did a lot of things to to uh, take care of some of the the really racist policies and 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 um, regressive policies, not progressive but regressive policy of the Wilson administration. Mm -hmm. This is a guy who actually um, showed birth of a nation mm -hmm. in the White House, and uh, uh, you know he he was a Southerner, although he it, because he was a president of a new. Princeton, it looked like he was New Jer from New Jersey. No, he was from the South, and he was as racist as could be. And uh, he he instituted race segregation in the in the in the in Washington D.C. And what a shameful shameful episode for the party. So anyway, uh, the Republicans didn't do that anything like that. Like that. Right. And, and just let me allow, allow me, uh, Doctor, for a moment, discuss, as you mentioned in the book, the national aspect of the Republican Party and looking for national government. And then we have Wilson and FDR and LBJ with the expansion of the federal system, with the Republicans answering to more of a state's rights position that could explain that evolution. Mm -hmm. Uh, to a little bit better degree, correct? Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I just I think that the state's right position is, um, um, in fact, to some extent, because the slavery issue was already settled, segregation was already settled, mm -hmm. and that it was um, it was a positive signal, uh, not necessarily a, um, an issue commitment, but a positive signal to the South that saying we're going to be more considerate of your positions. So I think that's what that. That was. We see this to some extent now with respect to the abortion policy, that there's a favor that the states should take the issue uh, on this. 
Right. And that's kind of the same. That's kind of the same thing. And one can argue that go in that direction. But but that is is kind of the same the same position. It seems to me. My, I guess I would to, my I would sum up this way. I would say that the Republican Party should do a couple things. That first of all, it should recognize that the electorate is different. Okay? It should recognize that it's much more uh, ethnically mixed and heterogeneous. It should also embrace immigration. Uh, we are all immigrants. Um, and uh, and that's only, the only way this nation is going to grow population. Mm -hmm. It's very, very clear. If you want the nation to grow population, it's only going to go through Im immigration. And so we've got to figure out a way to do that. More judges, check more background checks. Okay, if that's it, put get more judges. Check these people as they come in. Absolutely. Make sure you get come not crooks and criminals, and drug dealers coming in by all means. Right, legal but you've got to embrace it. You can't avoid it. You can't avoid it. You have to go after it. You've got to be smart going after it. And that's what I think the party ought to do. And should take some leadership in that position. I hope it does. The question, uh, the other point that you make in the uh, book, Doctor, as we finish up, is the fact that we need to be able to accept the results of elections. Of course, we need an election integrity, and we need to make sure that our elections are fair and that they're being run mm -hmm. accurately. But uh, when we have a result, then we get back to the idea of being one people and one nation and uh, getting back to what we've done for over 240 years again. I agree. Yeah, that, that, that's true. I, I, I think we've, we've have a, have had a long history of that. People across the world have admired the United States for that. Suddenly our reputation has been tarnished, not necessarily destroyed, but certainly tarnished. Well, here's the book, and we'll be putting it up on uh, the links to this video. And uh, it's something that every Republican, every citizen, every Democrat should be reading as well. It's so informative. And Dr. Jana has done such a wonderful work in political science for so long. One of the uh, in first inventors of using computer technology uh, to acquire this data. And of course, I'm interested in IT. So we'll have to talk about that yeah. again sometime. I'm a doctor, but I want you to come back to talk to us about your book on the Democratic Party as well. And that's complete. Would you do that for us? I'd love to. Thank you so much, Cheryl. It's, it's been a real pleasure for me and an honor to do this. Thank you so much. Well, we've been honored to have you, doctor, and uh, we revere all your hard work and all of your knowledge. And thank you for all the things that uh, you teach us. So thank you. And let's remember what uh, Lincoln did say in regards to the Emancipation Proclamation giving liberty to those who are oppressed. May we remember the great heritage of our Republican Party and restore those initial principles that Dr. Jane has suggested we do. Thank you very much.